Giles Brandreth, really appreciate you joining us after what was quite an uh, enthralling show here at the Edinburgh Fringe. Um, before I ask you the first question, then you have asked to set the scene. I would like to set the scene, Oscar, and I'd like to say hello to everybody who is watching and say this is quite a unique event for you because you're watching two people with five letter first names. And I think about this in relation to Oscar because Oscar Wilde, who's something of a hero of mine, said that all the great people in the history of the world, the people who made a difference, they tended to have five letters in their name. He gave as examples, obviously Oscar and Wilde, two five letter names, Jesus, Plato, and Jumbo, as in Jumbo the Elephant. Um, so here you are, Oscar, and here I am, Giles. So that's a very good start. We have five letter people. And you'll hear in the background possibly strange sounds. This is because we are speaking to you from a dressing room at the Pleasance Courtyard Theatre at the Edinburgh Fringe. Any of you watching this who thinks that showbiz might be your future, try and look around the room. Get a flavour of what this room is really like. This is actually a luxurious dressing room by the standards of dressing rooms. You'll see bulbs are missing, you'll see paint peeling, you'll see a cracked basin, you'll see that I share this dressing room with about two dozen other people who haven't actually learnt how to clean up after them. This is the reality of show business. Anyway, here we are, and, and the next show after mine, which is a great show, is beginning on stage, so that's what's happening in the background. But what are we here to talk about, Oscar? Why are we here? Giles, I wanted to start by asking you about competitiveness and competition. And I wanted to say that, or introduce the fact that your father bought the first game of Monopoly in 1936, is that right? And he met your mother playing it and you've, you've gone on to become a European Monopoly champion. Yeah, I suppose I am quite competitive. And where does this come from? Well, I think actually most people are a bit competitive. People, you know, very few people take part in a race and don't at least run along as though they're taking part in the race. Um, my father was a lawyer, mm. and he was a young lawyer in London in the 1930s. And uh, that Christmas, there was lots of publicity about this new game, Monopoly, that had come over from the States. And my father went to Selfridge's department store in London, queued up and bought the first set of Monopoly sold in England. He went back to his digs, the lodgings where he lived in Gower Street, said to the landlady, I bought this brand new game, everyone's talking about it, I want someone to play with. And she said, well, there's uh, a student, a Canadian student, uh, who's at London University, She's, you might play with her further down the first floor. Anyway, my father went, people are applauding, not my story, but what's happening on stage. Um, people, uh, he went and he met my mother, and a few weeks later they eloped. They ran off together. Oh, right, well. Wow. Um, and they went on honeymoon to Cornwall. Not a totally successful honeymoon because they hired a caravan with bunks. Not <laughs> ideal for a honeymoon. But anyway, many, many years later, um, I became the European Monopoly mm. Champion, took part in the World Monopoly Championships. You've done all of these things, Joe. You've done that, you've done writing, politics, you've set up a teddy, man, a teddy bear museum. Who's the real Giles Brandreth? These, Do you know? <laughs> these are hardly great achievements. Uh, let's face <laughs> it, I enjoy uh, playing, I used to enjoy playing Monopoly, and it was fun to be European Monopoly champion. I founded the National Scrabble Championships. Mm. I love Scrabble as a game. I'm interested in words and language. We played Scrabble when I was a child at home, and I went to a school called Beedales, which is in Hampshire, it's a boarding school. And it was founded by a man called John Badley. Now John Badley was a contemporary of Oscar Wilde. Right. So this Mr. Badley, who I knew, was born yep. in 1863 and died in 1964, age 101, something like that. Mm. And I knew this old boy, and we played Scrabble together. So I was taught to play Scrabble with a friend of Oscar Wilde's. Yeah. Quite impressive, shake my hand. <laughs> I want to do it afterwards, James, okay. I want to do it. <laughs> well, otherwise, he was shaking the hand that shook the hand, that shook the hand, that wrote The Importance of Being Earnest. Oh, and brilliant, yeah. Picture of Dorian Gray and all the rest of it. And this old boy playing Scrabble with me, he would use words yeah. that I said were obsolete, and he said they were current when I first learned them. So, yes, I like playing Scrabble, I enjoy collecting teddy bears, I started the teddy bear museum, but these are fun things to do. And basically, I think in life, you should have lots of 
varied interests. And what I've probably done is turn some of my hobbies and pastimes into things that have become public things. So I founded the Teddy Bear Museum, sorted out the National Scrabble Championship, yeah. um, played Monopoly, done lots of larking about. But I've also done, I hope, slightly more substantial things. I have three claims to fame. Okay? Number one. Number one, when I was an MP, and it's, it's a very good thing to be an MP, it's a very satisfying, rewarding life that I'm a member of Parliament. And I would encourage people interested in politics. It's a vocation though. Don't go in for money or glory, there aren't either of those now, but it's a fascinating vocation. You can actually make a difference in people's lives. And I, as a backbencher, introduced a piece of legislation that became the 1994 Marriage Act. What was the name of that um, citizen then who came up to you, a Mrs? Mrs Graybill. Mrs Graybill, that's it. You've obviously read my diaries. Breaking the code, yeah. Uh, Mrs Graybill, in the constituency, she had a yeah. castle called Peckforton Castle. And uh, I hope you can hear this, but everything, that's, it's rather quite fun, isn't it, trying to listen through the background music. Anyway, Mrs Graybill yeah. of Peckforton Castle wanted to be allowed to have weddings at her castle. But, um, she didn't have them at the local register office. So she came with this idea, and I took a constituent's idea, took it through Parliament. It began as a 10-minute rule bill, a way of getting a private member's bill up and running, and then it became the law. I am responsible for the 1994 Marriage Act. Though when my wife, who's in the corner of the room here, heard me being described once on local radio as the expert on the Marriage Act, she almost fell off her bunk laughing. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> anyway, that's my one claim to fame. Wonderful. My second claim to fame is, do you know London? You've been to Trafalgar Square recently? Yeah, I love, love London, yeah. Well, in Trafalgar Square, when I was a parliamentary private secretary at the Department of National Heritage, as it then was, then our culture ministry, walking through Trafalgar Square, I noticed a plinth that had nothing on it. And it had been a bare plinth mm -hmm. since Trafalgar Square was designed in the 1830s. And I said, we want something on that plinth. And um, so it came to pass. I went into the ministry and said, look, it was a bare plinth. And we got the whole set up going that now we have temporary works of art on that plinth. Still visitable today. Yeah. Yeah. And I've got a third claim to mm. fame, but that'll come to me in a moment. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, talking of your time in John Major's government, but you were government whip, but did you ever have eyes for perhaps a higher position, maybe even the top oh, yeah, job? Yeah. Of course, there's no, nobody becomes a politician without imagining they're going to be a prime minister, you know. Uh, so I was there with, you know, 650 other people who all wanted, expected, thought they would be, at least when they arrived, Prime Minister. Uh, and when I was your age, when I was at university, I was interviewed like this, so not as well, but similar to this, by the Sun newspaper, right. which wasn't then a tabloid, it was, a, believe it or not, a, a left-wing, mm. uh, large-format paper. And uh, they asked me what I wanted to be, and I said I, what I wanted to be was a sort of Danny Kay, and then Home Secretary. And I modified really what I wanted to be. Danny Kay was a enter famous entertainer in the 1950s. Uh, and I, that meant I wanted to be an entertainer and really wanted to be a Prime Minister. But I was interested in what the Home Office did. I was interested in prison reform. And that's what you go in to do. But actually, after a while, having when I arrived really been interested in the sound of my own voice, I actually became interested in what you could achieve. Mm. And my most satisfying time in Parliament when, was when I was a government whip. And you've read Breaking the Code, which is going to be reissued quite soon. And what is, and perhaps that is my third claim to fame, in that it's the only account yet written of the work of a government whip's office. What actually happens? What do the government whips do? You know, the, these notorious characters. Has been described, those, uh, that novel, as, as a fantastic account of actually yeah. what it's like, isn't it, as a backbencher? Indeed. Yeah. It's, not, it's not a novel, it's a diary yeah, yeah. of a, a real account of what happened on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you're interested also in politics, it's worth reading, because it tells you what it's like to be an aspiring politician, to go out to try and get a seat, to be chosen, then to spend years going around trying to be elected. And then, of course, you get they don't want you. Discover the end. They you don't want you. You lost your seat in '97 when Blair came to I power. I did. I was swept out in the. Did you have some admiration for Blair? Did he have a great political future ahead of him? Do you think? Well, change happens when the electorate want it to happen. Mrs. Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher, became prime minister because people at that time really felt it was time for a change. Something was wrong in the country. Same again then in '97. After 18 years mm. of Conservatives, 
people felt it was time for a change. They felt the government was tired. John Major, I think, was rather a remarkable Prime Minister with real achievements. The Northern Ireland peace process is down to John Major. Um, you know, and after the terrible recession of 1999-2, actually the economy was growing again. There was debt paid down. There were achievements of his government. But people had had enough of the Conservatives. Time for a change. So we got um, Tony Blair, who was a superb politician. There's no doubt of that. It's not easy being Prime Minister, keeping all those plates spinning, all juggling all the balls, keeping the thing going, being on top of it. You only have to look at the record of Gordon Brown to realise that being Prime Minister isn't easy. You know, Gordon Brown was a spectacular disaster in a short period of time. Right. People like John Major, Tony Blair, Margaret Thatcher, to sustain this job for 10 years is very challenging indeed. On a different note, we spoke to Benjamin Zephaniah yesterday, who, like you, spoke out against a British honours system. He rejected an OBE, and I've read that, that you don't like that system either. Well, what happened, I was actually involved, again, you can read in Breaking the Code, I, I was sort of involved in the working of the honours mm. system, in the sense of recommending people in the arts field for honours. And it's, it's basically unfair. There was a snobbery about it as well. For example, people in the area of comedy would get MBEs and OBEs, but people in the area of the classical arts, national theatre players, get CBEs and knighthoods because there's sort of, there's a kind of snobbery that comedy is sort of lower grade, that, you know, if you're making a carry-on film, that's not quite as important to the nation as if you're making some arty film that nobody wants to see. So there was, a sort of, there was that imbalance. Uh, and though it's nice, I mean, the Queen always says, isn't it nice to pat people on the back? And I've got no fundamental objection to the honour system, but the gradations of mm. it, the reason that I'm, I'm supposed to be against it is because I did the programme Room 101. Yes. And they make you think of things that you want to put in Room 101 and get rid of. <laughs> that indeed. And I had to think of something and, that I could tell funny stories about. Yeah. And I thought, I've got some funny stories I can tell about the honour system, so I chose that. But I'm not actually against it. So. When the Queen is minded to find a new Knight of the Garter, she'll find me ready and willing. <laughs> you have spoken a lot about your um, backing and support for the royal family and the monarchy. Well, I broadly speak, I mean, it's absurd in some ways, the idea of the monarchy, you know, calling people your majesty, your royal yeah. highness, and all of that. But actually, it's a system that has served the country very well for a thousand years. So, uh, and I'm, I'm a great fan of both the Queen and Prince Philip as individuals. I wrote a biography of them some years ago. Uh, and I got to know Prince Philip a bit um, when I was uh, the chairman of a charity called the National Playing Fields Association, which was the first charity that he took on. And they are remarkable people in the sense that they just keep going. They just deliver the goods year in, year out. And they are above politics and away from politics. Sometimes people say, oh, oh you're a friend of the Duke of Edinburgh. And I correct them and I say, no, what James Callaghan, former British Prime Minister, once said to me, because I, I said to him, oh, well, now ah, you're a knight of the garter and you're, you've become a friend of the royal family. He said, oh, no, senior royalty, what they offer you is um, friendliness, not friendship. There is a difference. <laughs> so I'm happy to say I'm on friendly terms with the Duke of Edinburgh, and I've met the Queen, and I've met the Prince of Wales, wrote a biography of him, and Camilla, great fan of theirs. I've seen Prince William in action. It's actually, it's a curious system, isn't it? But it seems to work, so I'm quite happy to go along with it. In, in the book, Breaking the Code, um, there is a, what I think is called an epigraph, some lines at the beginning of the book. And it's a quotation from Arthur Balfour, mm -hmm. British Prime Minister at the beginning of the 20th century. And Arthur Balfour said, cue a little pause in the music, nothing matters very much, and most things don't matter at all. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, there are lots of different ways to, to run a country. And, you know, the French have their president, the United States have their president. Um, we have a monarchy, and it's served us well. Mm. I like it. And I admire, I admire the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh very much indeed. Your book, The Joy of Lex, a fantastic book about words. You, you said language is what defines us. Why is it, why, why is language so much more than just communication with each other? Well, communication is fundamental. It isn't, in fact, much more than communication, but communication is the heart of it. As the philosopher Bertrand Russell said, no matter how eloquently a dog may bark, he cannot tell you that his parents were poor but honest. It's language that does that. I mean, we could look at each other, you and I, for hours on end. It would be charming, I'm sure. Uh, but it wouldn't be as good 
as a conversation can be. And the truth is, those who can use the language well, if you can write a good CV, even better if you can know what CV stands for, curriculum vitae, if you can actually present it well, write it well and articulately, if you can write a good love letter, if you can do a good CV and a good love letter, you will get a better life, you get a better job and a better girl or a better boy or whatever you're into. Mm. You know, actually words are how we keep in touch with people. So using the language, relishing the language, enjoying the language is important. And you'll get a better degree if you can write well. And they still like a bit of punctuation if you can manage that. Indented paragraphs even, you know. <laughs> it's a bit old fashioned, but why not? There's an inner Michael Gove coming out, I apologize. Talking of Tory, MPs, Jacob Rees-Mogg, ah, holds the uh, current record for the longest word spoken in Parliament, I think, isn't it? Do you know what it is? I think it's... Is it flocky nalki nilipification? That's exactly it. And you know what? I'm so glad you did that because I was going to attempt it and I wouldn't have been able to do Feel it. Feel free to say it that to me. That is it. Are you envious He's of him? character of Jacob Rees-Mogg. Of that record. I'm envious of his youth. Yeah. That's about the only thing I'm envious of. I'm sure he's a charming person. Not even his record in Parliament. Well, it's nice to um, have spoken the longest word in Parliament. Yeah. Um, and um, one or two of my speeches in Parliament are sort of on the on YouTube and on. Mm. Um, but what I found what's depressing a little bit about Parliament is this: that what most people say in Parliament doesn't get noticed. You're talking about Jacob Rees-Mogg speech in which he says "flockinaki vilification," which is fun. But actually, really, probably what he'd rather we knew is what he, you what know, made a speech yeah. about farming or, you know, industrial reform yeah. or, uh, you know. Uh, and the difficulty now with Parliament is that it isn't the fulcrum of debate in the yeah. way it once was. And what people say in Parliament doesn't count for as much as it used to. It's become the television studio, the radio studio, and I would like to see Parliament being more where things are announced and where people actually call the government to account and what people say in Parliament matters. Christopher Hitchens went at Oxford, I think he suggested, now I've got this written down, that, that you set out to make yourself into a Ken Tynan, that you wore a cloak and took your girlfriend up in a monoplane. He said, he said, these are not going to be known as the Brandreth years, I shall make sure of that. Did you know Christopher well? I knew Chris Hitchens well and I liked him a lot. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he wore a little Chairman Mao jacket and smoked little cheroots even when we were sort of 19 or 20. Uh, we were involved in the union together, mm. and I, I don't think he became president. I think I became president. Uh, you he did. Was, he was secretary or something. And you he? edited ISIS, and uh, you directed absolutely. the dramatic but society. Chris was yeah. there, and he was an active politician. We wrote for ISIS together, and we competed against each other mm. in elections. Um, it's frustrating that, because of course he is now this great iconic figure. In the flat where I'm staying in Edinburgh, believe it or not, there are 17 books by Christopher Hitchens on the shelves. <laughs> I'm going to put a couple of mine uh, to leave to disconcert. So I'm a fan of his. Um, I never wore a cloak. Um, but because of this quote, mm. because he said this, yeah. um, I can't now do an interview without people saying to me, have you still got the cloak? I never wore a cloak. But I did make a television film in 1968-69 they brought Kenneth Tynan to Oxford. And uh, Ken Tynan had been famous at Oxford in the late 1940s, early 50s. He was a, a drama critic for The Observer, uh, and a writer and a good journalist. And he became a theater uh, man. He became the first literary manager of the National Theater. Uh, and he was the first person to use the F word on British television. And he was an interesting uh, man. Uh, and he used the F word and he had a stammer. That was the sort of irony of it. Anyway, he wrote brilliantly. His theatre criticism is matchless. They came to make a film about him, and they wanted to choose somebody who was like him. Mm. And they looked at Christopher Hitchens, and then they found my number, and they came to me. <laughs> so um, <laughs> Chris Hitchens, in his Mao suit, didn't get the gig, and I did. did yeah. But I didn't wear a cloak. <laughs> and the, Let's make that perfectly clear. And I did, in fairness to Christopher Hitchens, I did try to take my wife up in an aeroplane. But we got to the aerodrome, and she's here, she can vouch for that. And the aeroplane didn't leave the ground. I'm so relieved, because she would have seen me in my true colours. Well, she has since seen me in my true colours, but at an early stage, and she might not be here in the dressing room 45 years later, because I would have been terrified in this aeroplane. Yeah. But yes. Yes, I, uh, so two thirds of what he mm. says is true. You kept your marriage secret, didn't you, for a couple of years? What, what was that? Well, 
We met at Oxford and we married uh, about five, in fact, almost exactly five years later. Mm. We met, met on the 6th of June. We married on the 8th of June in 1973. We met in 1968. And um, we didn't tell really anybody because we thought it would be nice to have a little intimate wedding. We had two good friends, a mm. um, uh, girlfriend of Michelle's came as one of the witnesses, and my best friend, an actor called Simon Goodell, who features in the show I'm currently doing and taking he on does. tour. Um, they, were my, they were our witnesses. And um, it was a lovely wedding. And my parents got married in the same register office, St. Marilyn, and they did it, mm. as it were, privately, secretly. Were they positive then when you ultimately told them? They were completely content because they'd done the same thing. Yeah. And they didn't even know they had to take witnesses. So my parents' witnesses, one was the cleaning lady and the other was the man in the street who <laughs> sold flowers. <laughs> Wonderful. So, but so it's a good, yeah. on the whole, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a good thing, marriage. It's good, it's good. Come, actually, if you read my book, The Secret, Seven Secrets of Happiness, Oh, yeah. Now that's what people might find interesting, mm. your viewers might find it. I've done a recent book for short books called The Seven Secrets of Happiness, based really on conversations I had with a very famous psychiatrist called Professor Anthony Clare. From Features Tr highly in your show here. In yeah. Edinburgh. And um, we, being married is one of the things that can make you happy mm. rather than being single. But read the book and find out that it's more complicated mm. than that. Giles, we spoke to Christopher Hitchens' brother. Peter. Peter, we spoke to him a couple of weeks ago and we talked about, we discussed the issues of Scottish independence. And here in Edinburgh, do you have an opinion on that topic or not? No. The joy is, I'm now a reporter for The One Show. <laughs> so, uh, on BBC. And I'm, so I'm, I'm completely above politics. Um, I take no part in party politics. I have no views one way or the other. I'm a world person. Mm. I know English people who would love them to be independent um, because they don't like the subsidy that they have to give to Scotland. But I, I, to be honest, it doesn't worry me. Um, I'm ready to go through passport control if need be. Mm. I just love Edinburgh as a city. It's the birthplace of Arthur Conan Doyle, oh, the man who created Sherlock Holmes, and a city that can give you Robert Louis Stevenson, you know, who created Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Arthur Conan Doyle, Sir Walter Scott, who gave you all these things, Alexander Fleming, mm. who, as a result of whom you and I are both alive because of penicillin, has to be one of the great cities of the world. Mm. And it tolerates. And the joy of being a Conservative MP up here is they, come, they don't actually know what a Conservative MP is in Scotland, so they welcome me with open arms. <laughs> Let's finish with this. I, I simply don't believe you are as good in real life as you are on the radio at just a minute. So. Oh, Lord. Without hesitation, deviation, and the other one. <laughs> exactly. What is the other one? Repetition. I've got it written down. Repetition. Without those three things, one minute on this interview, and we'll finish there. Let's see how long you last, Charles. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very honoured and excited to have been attending this interview, or conversation, as we might also call it, with young Oscar here. It is a name with five letters that is memorable. Fingal O'Flaherty Wills Wild is the name by which we also know a writer that we can't actually repeat his Christian name. But the first way of approaching this young man is to use that particular nomenclature. I have thoroughly enjoyed our encounter and I would love to repeat it. I would particularly like to say to all of you people who have viewed this and who have spotted the three repetitions that he would have <laughs> noticed but sadly he doesn't have a buzzer so cannot stop me. And so as we come to the culmination of my conversation with Chat Politics I want to say what an honour it has been and to thank all of you for staying tuned for what has seemed like just two years but in fact has only been 60 seconds. But what memorable ones they have been. Giles Brandreth, I really appreciate you taking the time out to talk to me. You're shaking the hand that shook the hand, you know, of Christopher Robin. So you're shaking the hand that shook the hand that held the paw of the original Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> Fantastic. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Sir.